We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. What's up, everybody? Welcome in to another episode of Finding Freedom here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And I got a great episode lined up for you guys today. Kind of a unique episode. Going to be talking about the role of faith in the American Revolution. Got a, an author of an awesome new book out. I'll introduce him in just a minute here. Going to be a really cool episode for you guys. Uh, different way to look at Memorial Day, really. A lot of times Memorial Day, we're talking about these recent wars. And I, I really agree with what Brian McWilliams said on uh, Wednesday's episode of Electric Liberty Land. So if you didn't hear that, go back and check it out. But Memorial Day also talks about, you know, it's really about our, our revolution too and uh, the sacrifices that people made uh, getting, uh, you know, our freedom in this country from uh, from the British. So I'm excited to bring you guys a unique take on that. Uh, just a quick reminder, as you know, of course, I talked about Electric Liberty Land on Wednesdays. On Monday, we have uh, Mark Clare shows our flagship program, longest running program. And uh, be sure to subscribe to get all three. And, uh, you know, we've been we've been out hitting the podcast circuit. If you want to hear Mark, Brian, and I together on an episode of another podcast, you can check out Read Coverdale's podcast, The naturalist capitalist and uh that was that was a fun show i think he has it in podcast form it's on it's on youtube at least so check out his youtube that was a couple days ago it's gotta be out by now and speaking of other podcasts um there's so many podcasts out there so many libertarian podcasts i think the uh one of the most unique ones going right now is uh burning daylight with my man matt mckinley he's a legit cowboy talking to other legit cowboys and cowgirls about cowboy shit. It's cutting up, telling jokes, having a good time. Check it out. It's called Burning Daylight. And you know what, guys? I'm excited for today's show. Excited to give you a little different take on uh, Memorial Day, reflecting on it, which was this past Monday. And uh, hope you guys enjoy it. All right, let's get into the show. My guest today on Finding Freedom is Dan Leroy. He's a, an author, a journalist, a teacher. He's been the director of writing and publishing of the writing and publishing department at Lincoln Park Performing Arts Charter School in Midland, PA since 2006. Uh, his writing about music and politics has appeared in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Newsweek, The Village Voice, and lots of other sites. I could list them all. Dan is here today to discuss his new book. It's called Liberty's Lions. I love that name. Very close to Lions of Liberty. So the full name is Liberty's Lions, the Catholic revolutionaries who established America. Quick overview in it. Dan recounts how American Christians, American Christians overcame widespread prejudice against popery to make some of the most important contributions to our cherished freedoms. Dan, welcome to Finding Freedom. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. It's my pleasure and privilege. Well, great to have you here. And, uh, you know, this is, to be perfectly honest and forthright, this is a, uh, a book and interview that is not typically in my, my wheelhouse. Um, I, am, I am a Christian. Um, so from that aspect, that's really what got me interested in, in going down this path here. I, and I am very interested in history. So those two things tie together. Um, plus also with what's going on in, with modern day with, with COVID-19. And uh, I think the importance of, of faith in that, I think it all kind of all kind of ties together. So before we get into the book, just if you could give my audience, uh, I gave a little bit of background on you at the top, but Tell them more about yourself, what, uh, what drives you, and what motivated you to write this book. Uh, well, that's a great question. And uh, the motivation for writing the book, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, I was born Catholic, raised Episcopalian, returned to the Catholic faith uh, about a dozen years ago. And since then, I've been lucky to live 
and worship in a, a parish that is uh, kind of unlike most of the other parishes, I, I think, in America these days. It's run by an exceptional group of priests. One of the things they do is uh, they have a perpetual adoration chapel. I was sitting in the chapel, uh, it's really been a couple of springs ago, and I was reading uh, a thing in a publication called Magnificat. It's a great writer called Anthony Esselin, who is also a Catholic, and he was writing about a Catholic revolutionary named Casimir Pulaski uh, and his contributions to the revolution. And there was a line at the end of this piece that said, you know, there were some other Catholic revolutionaries. He named three or four other people and I thought, you know, I, I didn't really know that. And I went looking for the book that would accompany all this and there wasn't one. So I decided I would try to write it. And as I got deeper into it, it wasn't just that you know, the book didn't exist and I was trying to fill that vacuum, I realized that the fact that the book didn't exist probably has something to do with the fact that Catholic contributions to the revolution have been perpetually underrated. So mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm going to make all that up uh, the first time out, but it was a it was an extra motivator to try to put all of these stories that had been kind of scattered here and there under one set of covers for what I think is the first time. Yeah, and it's a very, very well-written book, detailed book in these stories, impressive detail, taking you through the backgrounds on these individuals. Um, one thing, I mean, I wasn't very familiar with or I hadn't learned a lot about just the uh, sort of the, the persecution that the Catholics went through in the early colonial days. Um, so can you give give the listeners kind of an, an idea about about that era what what that was like for for catholics in the in the early time in the uh colonies absolutely i think one of the things that we maybe understand better than than the persecution that american catholics face is the persecution that british catholics face i think that's a little bit more on the historical record mm -hmm. we don't necessarily think about it happening here and yet it really it did happen, and it, it's a significant part of the story. You know, Catholics at this time, by and large, could not worship publicly. Uh, the only places in the British Empire uh, in the revolutionary era where you could attend a public mass, both of them were in Philadelphia, Old St. Joseph's and Old St. Mary's Church. And nowhere else in the entire British Empire at the time could you celebrate mass publicly. Catholics uh, were subject to a variety of taxes and restrictions, couldn't vote uh, generally, uh, could not hold public office, uh, down to things like if you wanted your child to get a Catholic education, you couldn't do it in America, so you had to send them abroad. But often you had to pay an additional tax, and it was for the time pretty exorbitant just for the privilege of sending your kids off to a foreign country on a very dangerous sea crossing where you might never see them again. That little thing, although it wasn't a little thing to the people who had to go through it, I think encapsulates this idea. So Catholics had to worship uh, at home. Uh, some of them had private chapels. Some of them were uh, served by traveling priests who made uh, circuits over the course of several states. If you were lucky, uh, a priest might visit once, maybe if you were really super lucky, twice a year. But worship by and large was a, a private thing. It had to be conducted undercover. Uh, and the biggest thing I think you would say is even if you had lots and lots of money, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who's mentioned in Liberty's Lines, uh, as one of the most prominent American Catholics. This is a guy who, if he wasn't the richest guy in America at the time, he was close. For all the money he had and all the money that his father and his father before him had, still mm -hmm. second-class citizens all the way. It didn't matter how much money you had, how smart you were. During this time, persecution meant first and foremost that you could not practice your your faith publicly, and you were viewed as second class in the eyes of your fellow colonists in a whole variety of ways. One thing that's talked about early in the book is um, 
the celebration or the the riots i guess better uh better explained as um for uh in britain it would be for what they call guy is it fox day i don't know how you say that Mm -hmm. the the gunpowder plot yep right right and then in the u.s it was they called it something else it was more a outright attack on on catholics right hope's night Hope's which, night, sounds, that's which it. sounds like a fun Catholic uh, celebration, except it really wasn't. It was kind of the opposite. It was an yeah. opportunity to get drunk, burn the Pope in effigy, and really indulge in some pretty public anti-Catholicism. Yeah, some pretty pretty crazy stuff. And then that kind of just, the timing, it just kind of stopped. And that, um, I guess that same time of year, it kind of turned into a uh, protest against the Stamp Act, right? which is what ultimately led up to uh, sort of the uh, support and the energy for the, uh, for the revolution. And one of the guys who, who does put a stop to it, in fact, the guy who really uh, kind of puts the nail in it is George Washington himself when he takes over the Continental Army and says, look, we gotta stop doing this. If we want Catholics to support this patriot cause, we can't uh, indulge in this kind of public and ritual uh, persecution and humiliation, we got to knock it off. And mm-hmm. it's a testament to George Washington that that's pretty much what happened. So for Catholics, it's one reason why George Washington gets a chapter in Liberty's Lands, because he's a guy who not only talked the talk, but also walked the walk when it came to tolerance and, and acceptance of Catholics. Mm-hmm. So l- like you said, you have chapters dedicated to, uh, to different influential um, people in history, ca- Catholics and uh, and otherwise, and the one you referenced uh, a little while ago, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, oh. right? He's got the yeah. Got the, um, so he was instrumental through there was this, and I hadn't heard this before, um, through writing of these uh, these first citizen letters, yeah. right? This this back and forth. Can can you take us through what what exactly happened there? Yeah, and it's really, uh, it's a story that kind of plays into what eventually happened as far as the revolution goes. Uh, the, the short version of it is Daniel Delaney, who was a, a very prominent lawyer. In fact, Charles Carroll called him the, probably the best lawyer in the colonies, uh, wrote a, a series of letters defending policy in Maryland, which allowed uh, the governor the ability to kind of set taxes at his whim. Uh, That's the very short and abridged version of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at a time when, as you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, like the the opposition to taxation, both from without and within in the colonies is starting to grow. And Charles Carroll essentially responds to this series of, of letters they kind of have a back and forth in the press over several months. Charles Carroll adopts this persona that you mentioned called First Citizen. And the thing that's significant about it is he not only wins this argument with this very celebrated and decorated lawyer, he does it in a way that kind of lays the groundwork for what people will eventually understand as the reason for independence in the first place. And what he says to boil it down is, look, uh, Maryland is its own separate colony. Maryland, by virtue of the fact that it has a colonial charter and it's founded on the promise of religious freedom, Maryland is something different than England. And English law and English custom don't necessarily apply here. We have our own set of precedents and we're our own thing. And when you look at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, some years after this, and uh, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary. And that's really just a paraphrase of this argument that Maryland Catholics had been making for years and years and years that we're our own entity and, and we're no longer beholden uh, exclusively, again, to English law and English tradition. So the r- real intellectual roots of the revolution come from Maryland Catholics and Charles Carroll of Carrollton is the guy who kind of puts it in written form in this series of letters. Was it in these letters where he sort of crystallized, we, we, we're familiar with, hear, with hearing, uh, you know, no taxation without representation. And of course, 
if you have the representation, then all of a sudden the taxation could still be there, but now you have representation, so it's permissible. And he, he, he kind of went one step farther than that saying, um, you know, really that that's not enough. And, you know, it's, it's a little, it's more radical. And not only is it, it's necessary to have the, the, to take the next step and have that freedom, right? That, that's exactly right. And I'm glad you pointed that out because this is a, an argument that, you know, we hear all the time, as you mentioned, ta taxation without representation implies that, it, hey, if we get representation, then all of a sudden taxation might be okay. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin spent a lot of time in London trying to do just that, get representation for the colonies in Parliament and had... Had the British come around to that idea, you know, for the price of a couple of seats in Parliament, who knows what might have happened, but they, they couldn't see it that way. But Charles Carroll, as you say, uh, that, that wasn't enough. Uh, the taxation and representation argument suggests, again, that the colonies in England are the same thing. And he said, they're not the same thing any longer. We have been founded on a separate set of principles. We have lots and lots of history, which is one of the things he argued in those letters. Look, we've already done things differently on several occasions here. The bond between us no longer applies. Charles Carroll figured this out 10 years before the revolution. You have many of the best known founders who even after Lexington and Concord were still trying to figure out how to put the genie back in the bottle and say, well, you know, listen, maybe we could probably still salvage something. Charles Carroll was over it before any of them. So people are listening to this probably around Memorial Day weekend, maybe a little before, maybe a little after, depending when they download it. And I know myself, when I think of Memorial Day, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, you're thinking of the Revolutionary War, but you're thinking of people who were, you know, from the from America that weren't from other countries and two of the uh, individuals in this book uh, from Poland that you know had a, a, a played a big role in uh, getting in, in uh, independence for the United States I'm gonna mess up this name probably both of them hey, Thaddeus right. Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko? how do you say it? yeah Kosciuszko, I think Kosciuszko. Is the and Casimir uh, Pulaski which I believe you just mentioned him before yeah. But uh, both of these guys were pretty much, from I mean, from what I read, they were essentially kicked out or pushed out of their out of Poland, right? That's that's correct. So hey. how did how did they make their way over to the United States? And you can you know take your time talking about each of them if you want to. Yeah. But uh, what what was their what was their impact here? Well, they had a great impact, and and to go to the part about being kicked out of Poland, uh, kind of they were kicked out for different reasons. Pulaski was, was kicked out because uh, he was and his family was part of the struggle to kind of keep Poland independent of Russia. Uh, and that led to him being part of the armed resistance in Poland. And it also led to him essentially uh, being captured, eventually escaping from Poland and kind of making his way across Europe until he found his way to France and he there found his way to America. Kosciuszko was a little bit of a different situation. He had a romantic entanglement that mm -hmm. went wrong and uh, the, the girl's father, uh, who thought that uh, Kosciuszko just wasn't good enough for his daughter, uh, was also seeking revenge. So Kosciuszko had to get out of the country before uh, this nobleman exacted he, his- He tried to, I think the way you wrote it, he tried to tried to run off with uh, with the daughter and they, they tracked did. him down and knocked him unconscious. And they, they did. It was the, the, the way, if you're gonna elope, this is the way you hope that it never uh, goes. Right. Uh, but both of these guys were part of a, a much bigger migration of foreign soldiers who found their way to America and they became part of this group of soldiers who, who and there were a lot of them, we should point out, who, mm -hmm. uh, who were kind of no hopers. But out of this group of, of soldiers of fortune who saw some opportunity in this revolution that was happening in the colonies, there were a lot of diamonds uh, among the dross. And two of the diamonds, for sure, were Pulaski 
and Kosciuszko. Pulaski is a great horseman. He's the founder of the American cavalry. He can do amazing things on horseback. And one of the things he does is he saves George Washington's life at the Battle of Brandywine in 1777. Washington is probably moments away from capture. Pulaski and his cavalrymen swoop in and delay things just enough so that they can get Washington to safety. Kosciuszko is a great engineer. He uh, is one of the primary architects of West Point. He gives George Washington this impregnable fortress along the Hudson that he's wanted for a long time. Later, he goes south and becomes part of the battles in the Southern Theater where his engineering expertise leads him to construct a series of flat boats that allow the Patriots to keep the British on the run and, and really wear them out. In the South, it was a war of attrition and Kosciuszko's Flat boats are the thing that kind of keeps the Patriots one step ahead, wears out the British Army, and kind of leads us up to the battle that we're all familiar with at Yorktown. Yeah, just two uh, two very interesting stories that once again I I have not read anywhere else. So kind of to go back to what you said at the outset, um, not that these stories aren't told anywhere, but they're not they're they're not captured in in a way that. Uh, you know, uh, somebody, a person of faith or, or a Catholic can go and just find all these works together of all these influential uh, Christians. So one thing in the book is the people that we know about from this time. You talked about George Washington, Ben Franklin, John Adams. In general, what, what was the view of, of those, you know, influential historical characters that everyone knows? What was their view of, of Catholics? Uh, by and large, it was pretty negative. And here we're talking about pretty familiar founders, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, Samuel Adams. Uh, the views were, it kind of ranged, I guess, from uh, bemused to, to outright hostility. And there are a lot of writings on the subject from some of those folks. One of the most famous is after the passage of the Quebec Act, Alexander Hamilton says, and I paraphrase, you know, doesn't it make your blood run cold to think about uh, all of these Catholic immigrants overrunning the country uh, as the Pope's army? Now, coming from a guy, uh, Alexander Hamilton, who was himself an immigrant, that's a, a little on the rich side. However, we got to give Hamilton credit because later in the war, when things are looking pretty bleak, uh, he writes a, a letter and says, look, uh, if the French and the Spanish don't save us, then we're not going to be saved. And he was absolutely right. Had it not been for the French and Spanish, so we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And the contributions of most of those soldiers uh, were talking about Catholics. So one of the things uh, uh, about the numbers, one reason why I think Catholics during the revolution, their contributions have been underrated is it's a numbers game. The numbers will tell you that at the time in the colonies, there's 24 to 30,000 Catholics and not all of them are patriots. That's less than 2% of the total population. So it's pretty easy to look at those numbers and say, well, how significant could these contributions have been really? And I think the two pronged argument is number one, out of that small, small group of people came some of the great leaders of the revolution, military leaders, economic leaders, intellectual leaders, spiritual leaders. But the other part of the numbers game is once you start factoring in the contributions of these foreign soldiers, French, Spanish, you just mm -hmm. mentioned the, the Polish soldiers, uh, the uh, German soldiers who were Catholics. You know, there's a number out there that says that perhaps as many as 70% of the soldiers who fought on the side of independence were Catholic. Really? So once you add the foreign contributions of this, the numbers start to look a little bit different. And the picture that we're kind of familiar with, which says that, hey, Catholics are so small that they really didn't count. Uh, no, not so much when you when you factor in those foreign contributions. What was what were the reasons or why was there this animosity against Catholics during that time period? I mean, a lot of it comes straight from Britain, and, and the, there's a, a chapter in, in Liberty's Lines where we kind of trace the history of, uh, you know, the fate of Catholics, both in England and in Maryland. And they're kind of parallel histories, because what happens as far as Catholic persecution 
uh, in England eventually finds its way to the colonies. And, you know, even in Maryland, which is a colony that is founded on this promise uh, of religious toleration, even then, uh, those, the two boats that brought the first settlers to Maryland, uh, ultimately Catholics are outnumbered even, even among that initial group of settlers. And, you know, to, to go back to the, the roots of anti-Catholicism in England, is, it's probably a longer story than anybody <laughs> who's listening wants to get into, but I guess the best way to say it, and to kind of go back to an earlier point, mm -hmm is what happened in Britain ultimately happened in America. And part of the, the great contribution of people like Charles Carroll of Carrollton was again to say, hey, this conjoined history that we have, uh, it, it's not automatic. It's not something we should take for granted. Uh, Maryland is founded again on the promise of religious liberty. And that means that it is uh, no longer beholden to English law and English custom. We have our own history, our own customs. And what those say is that Catholics have a place at the table. Now, wasn't sometimes that was true in practice and sometimes it wasn't, but intellectually, the idea is that the, this kind of uh, back and forth history of Catholic persecution, it stops here in the colonies, in particular in Maryland, because of the, the reasons for which Maryland was founded. Right. So in, in pulling this book together, I, I imagine this took several years to, to pull all this together? Or? Uh, it was probably more like a, a couple. Uh, couple. Once, oh, yeah, yeah, several's probably, yeah, several. Okay, probably. I said, well, <laughs> once, once, I, uh, once I get started, uh, I, I, I like to be single-minded if possible. Yeah. So, did, you, did you have a pretty clear vision for, for where you wanted to go with it at the outset or did it come together as you were researching? Uh, I think probably a, a little bit of both. I, I had some ideas uh, about some people that I wanted to focus on, but as I got deeper into it, some of the stories that, that I really wasn't familiar with at all kind of emerged in the course of the research. A great example of that is the story of uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, Lafayette's wife, in other words, and everybody knows about Lafayette. He's the mm -hmm. hero of two worlds, uh, both in America and at France. Uh, but his wife is a is someone that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with. Lafayette, by his own admission, was not a great Catholic. He was a nominal Catholic, which was true, uh, certainly of of. I guess you would say uh, enlightened people of the time, and a lot of them were French, but his wife was a, a different story. His wife was very devout. His wife believed so strongly in their family that when Lafayette's imprisoned after the French Revolution, because a lot of people in Europe are very angry at this revolution that they think he has helped to start, Lafayette's imprisoned in Olmutz and, and his wife, who has just escaped death row, and the French Revolution gathers up their two daughters, goes to the prison at Olmutz and says, listen, our family's been separated long enough. Let us in. We're going to be in prison together. And they mm -hmm. are imprisoned as a family for two years. And the fact that his wife went and, and kind of got the attention of people across Europe and in America, is probably the main reason why Lafayette is eventually released, because it starts to become a pretty embarrassing thing when the Marquis and his wife and his two daughters are all uh, imprisoned under less than ideal conditions. And then uh, beyond that, his wife really conducts a lifelong battle for his immortal soul. She knows that he is not devout, but she never stops trying to win him back over to the faith. And that's something that didn't stop until she drew her last breath. And whether she was successful, I guess that's one of those things we maybe yeah. find out in the next life. But if she was not successful, it's certainly not because of her lack of effort. She was kind of like a, a, a Saint Monica for her time trying to, to convince St. Augustine to return to the faith. And Adrienne de Lafayette is, is a modern day version of, of that kind of saint, I think. 
Yeah, very, very cool story. And uh, savvy PR, really, to to go you know go into the prison. A mistake on the the part that they let let her in because yeah, like you said, that kind of exposed them for how uh, how absurd it was. But so to, to uh, kind kind of look at the the larger picture here, you're you're doing all this research, you're writing the book. Was there anything during that process that really shocked you? that uh, took you by surprise that that you weren't expecting that that jumps out when you think back? I think it's less something that that I found in the research that relates to any particular individual. There were a lot of surprises like that, but I think maybe the biggest surprise of all is the time that the book happened to be written. And when I really started this in earnest uh, was just about the time that the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hits, as everybody knows, churches are closed. You Mm -hmm. can't go to mass in a lot of places. If you're lucky, you can do it through Facebook or YouTube or some other social media. But there are a lot of people who are shut out of the faith that is so important to them that they practice on a regular basis. You can't receive the sacraments. And in writing the book, writing about these colonial Catholics who also suffered a a similar hardship, although for very different reasons, it really makes you appreciate, or at least made me appreciate, Mm -hmm. you know, the old story, these things that we take for granted, and then you realize how fragile a lot of this stuff is, and you can lose these things that you take for granted, really at, at a moment's notice and completely by surprise. So kind of writing the book and writing about these persecuted Catholics in the shadow of COVID-19 it's probably the biggest surprise just because of what it made me realize about the commonalities between then and now. And I think, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that you're a Christian and a historian, and I don't know. I wouldn't call myself an historian. That's <laughs> well, you, you, you appreciate, I like history. Yeah. You appreciate history. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, well, that's close enough. I don't know. I don't know which group is, uh, is becoming more marginalized these days. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, to to successfully sell any kind of history, I think the thing you got to do is make people realize, like, hey, it's it's relevant to now. It isn't just something that happened at the time and, and then it ceases to have any connection to us. And COVID and, and the pandemic really kind of made that connection for me uh, with these colonial Catholics while I was writing this book. So biggest surprise, I'd have to say probably that. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that's been eye-opening for me during this COVID time, and I can only imagine it was just like you were talking about, so impactful for you, just be, being so involved in this and reading these stories and seeing the sacrifices that were made by these individuals. But faith just, be, I mean, faith is always important, but when it's, when you realize, wow, this is, this is really all I have, not all you have right now, but it, it, it holds you up. And you start to look at the uncertainty around you as things are falling down and people losing jobs and different things, people passing away, getting sick. And it, it, when you're able to focus on that faith faith, and, and focus on that truth, um, it really makes me honestly wonder how people who don't have that, how they're able to get, get through it. Um, but I, I mean, that's, I, I, I guess that's something deeper to reflect on, <laughs> but. Well, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And, and I think just to add one thing on to it, I mean, the, the idea that I think a lot of Catholics and a lot of Christians have kind of gotten away from, and I'm probably as guilty of this as anybody, is you know, the idea that sacrifice and suffering are extras somehow, that they're things you do if you feel like it, but if you don't feel like you have to do it. And covid I think kind of put that in focus mm-hmm. and, and reading about the people in this book kind of put that in focus as well. Sacrifice and suffering aren't, uh, they're not bugs, they're features of the mm-hmm. faith. And, uh, and again, writing about these folks and researching their lives and seeing what they had to go through and the sacrifice and suffering that was part of their everyday life, it really kind of brought that point home to me for sure. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point and uh, a, a very very timely book, I think, to to read now. Um, tell people how they can find the book, buy the book, and uh, anything else that you'll you'd like to plug. 
Absolutely. Well, the book is available from the publisher, Sophia Institute Press, and that's at sophiapress.com. I'm sorry, sophiainstitute.com. Sophiainstitute.com is their website, and you can get the book there. You can certainly get it from Amazon, from Barnes & Noble, and all the usual online suspects. And if you would like a signed copy of the book, you can get one from my website, which is Dan Leroy. That's L-E-R-O-Y. Dot com, and I'll be happy to sign one up any way you like and ship it right out to you. And if you go to my website, you can also find out about some of the speaking engagements that I have coming up. And I'm trying to add to that uh, as well. So I'm hoping to have a kind of getting out from the shadow of COVID, uh, more busy summer. Do, uh, doing some re oh. real life speaking engagements. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I've That's done so, done some Zoom stuff, and you know, I teach. So obviously, yeah. the past year has been all Zoom all the time, and we're just getting back to in person teaching. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I like to get out there and mm -hmm. uh, see real people and and do some real things for a change. So. Well, that's, so that's yeah, awesome. if you're interested, yeah, check out the website and uh, I will be updating it there. And if you want to book an appearance, you can also do that through the website as well. well I will link to all that on the show notes page. Dan Leroy, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing with us today. I really appreciate it. John, it's my pleasure, my privilege to be here. Thank you so much for letting me be a guest and talk about this book. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed that interview on Finding Freedom, another awesome guest. And hopefully you guys also have subscribed to the Lions of Liberty podcast and you're getting all three of our unique shows in your uh, little listening device delivered to your ears. Um, if you haven't, please do that. Just go to your app, you know how to do it and subscribe. You can also leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. We would prefer if you did it on Apple Podcasts, but anywhere you can on the internet, please leave us a positive comment. Also, if you want to support us, we would love that too. Please go to patreon.com slash lines of liberty. You can uh, support us for as little as a couple bucks. Or if you get in at a higher level, you get merchandise and access to us and all the way up to you can advertise on the show or get to even produce a show. So check it all out, patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. And if you haven't checked it out yet, please consider checking out the Lions of Liberty store where we have some awesome t-shirts. We have a taxation is death t-shirt with an awesome design. We have a wax on tax off t-shirt. And we're always coming up with new ideas and adding new t-shirt designs to the store. Check that out at lionsofliberty.store. And if you're in the pride, you get a discount on anything you buy in the store. So you do both of those things and you win. That's all I got, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning.